Let's get the ball rolling today with a great discussion on socialism, the travesties that we've seen of socialized systems historically, and why it is essential that the United States not go down this road to serfdom, this road to socialism, especially for the up-and-coming generations, millennials and Generation Z. Let's talk with two fellow members of these generations. Here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, pleased to be joined by the founder of Young Americans Against Socialism, Morgan Ziegers, as well as Christian Lasfall, who is an ambassador at the Falkirk Center. Welcome to you both to the show. Good to have you. Thank Great you. Thanks for coming on. So I, I'm so excited to have you both here because we're really going to get into a couple of different angles on this. One is why socialism is so bad, and you both have excellent perspectives on that from your organizations and your own personal backgrounds. But also to really talk a little bit about what we're thinking is going on in terms of the millennial generation and Generation Z on these issues. Um, and, and I want to start with Christian specifically because – you have your own personal family story of your family having come here to the United States, fleeing the tyranny of Fidel Castro's socialist regime in Cuba in 1980. Tell us your personal story. Yeah, so my family actually came as Cuban refugees on the Mariel boat lift in 1980. They were one of the uh, fortunate uh, Cubans who were able to come over to the United States. But the entire reason why they sought that freedom, despite the fact that they understood that the family whom they left behind may very well face punishment for them deciding to leave the country, uh, they did so because they knew there was an opportunity in the United States that did not exist in Cuba, that there were opportunities for them to succeed here and provide for their family here and live a life of freedom here that was not possible in any stretch of the imagination in Cuba and not better available anywhere else in the world than in the United States of America. And so they packed their one suitcase for eight people, which was enough to carry essentially all of their belongings and make the two week trek as they were taken from point to point, uh, unsure if they had just embarked on a lie that they, the government told them they could leave, but they might be killed on their way to finally their destination point where they were able to board a boat um, from benevolent Americans who sent their boats over to Cuba to pick them up and bring them over to the land uh, of opportunity. But they, they came here specifically because they needed to escape the tyranny, the stronghold, and the inhibition of any kind of individual freedom that exists in, in Cuba. And Christian, when it comes to the legacy of Fidel Castro's regime and what you have learned from your family, what is the most startling thing, if you could, if you could pick one or maybe two, uh, startling lessons learned from the tyranny of that kind of regime, what would it be? I think one of the most startling things is how intense the censorship is. I think one of the best combatants to socialism is the ability to freely discuss the evils that are experienced in those systems. And we see that the first, one of the first things that socialist and, and eventually communist governments have to do is they have to silence dissent. They have to stop people from expressing a, a point of view that might be contrary to the idea that they're trying to sell. Because if you explain to people the benefits of freedom and they believe them because they are better, uh, you might cause that communist or socialist government to lose their power. So that's one of the most starting, starting, startling excuse me, lessons that I see, and one of the biggest threats that I see uh, seeping into the United States with cancel culture like we have right now, mm. or with speech codes that certain uh, elected officials of ours would like to see imposed here in the United States. And that is all a great first step in silencing dissent so they can continue to advance their socialistic lies. If you can con convince a population and hide dissenting points of view, then it's a lot easier to inflict these positions on them because they don't know any better and they don't know any alternative. Yeah, they don't have not only the freedom to choose their words, but the freedom to choose who they want to listen to and to hear different exactly. ideas expressed. A couple weeks mm -hmm. ago, our Free to Choose Friday was focused on the issue of free speech, and it's so fundamental to a free society, to be sure. Uh, Morgan Zeger is with Young Americans Against Socialism. You found of the organization, one of the great things that I think uh, YAS has done has been an effort to really highlight stories of different people who have survived these kinds of oppressive, totalitarian, socialist regimes. What have you learned from all that kind of work and, and partnering up and hearing these stories? Of course, and thank you again for having me on. I will say my family hasn't come from a socialist or communist country like Christians, but they came uh, from Italy through Ellis Island and started a bakery in New York State. And I will say I do love this country and I'll do anything to protect it. I see the biggest threat to America as the rise of socialism amongst millennials and Gen Z. 
What I say, though, there is a study that says nine, uh, 70% of young Americans currently would vote for a socialist. It's from the Victims of Communism Partnership poll with YouGov. And my counter to that is 70% of young Americans do not want to seize the means of production. They're being lied to about what socialism is. In order to push the socialist narrative, the socialist left has to distort basic fact, deny basic economics, and basic history. And I say, including Christian story and the other powerful testimonies, the only way to provide undeniable truth and undeniable fact is through the truth provided in first-hand testimonies uh, like Christians. And so that's why we make these educational social media videos that tell the testimony of first-hand experiences. Yeah, it is so fundamental to understand, in order to understand the trials and tribulations of those who've lived under socialist utopias, what, in order to understand, you have to hear those stories because there is a lot of misinformation. And to your point, Morgan, uh, in terms of freedom and free markets and also free speech, I mean, fundamental to that, too, is the ability to create your own business. And that's not something that you have in these socialist societies in terms of being able to own private property and also set up your own establishment. You're, you've created your own small business set in addition to Young Americans Against Socialism as your organization. Tell us about your experience there and how that really underscores the virtues of the free market versus socialism. Thank you for bringing that up. I do have a small woodworking business. I make wooden American flags. And I like to tell people in my generation about that because I used that business to pay off my student loans. I taught myself to make those flags using YouTube tutorials. But I will bring it to a larger issue here. And that's a big misunderstanding about what, what socialism is. What it is is the, the seizing of the means of production, the nationalization of industries, the ending of private business. You have groups like Justice Democrats, the Democrats of America specifically. If you go on their website, it talks about how they plan to get rid of private business in exchange for community-owned businesses. That's an interesting term. And what they talk about is how they don't actually have a long-term plan to achieve getting rid of private business in America. And so for the short term, they'll work to gain control of private business through high taxes and greater regulation. The distinction that needs to be made in the minds of young Americans, though, is the difference between Nordic Europe, which Bernie Sanders and AOC and the rest of the school say their policies will make us like. Unfortunately, in reality, Nordic Europe relies on capitalism. They love private business. Yes, they have high taxes and a lot of regulations, but at the end of the day, they have big programs that are funded by the wealth created from capitalism. If the Democratic Socialists of America, like AOC, got their way, they would work to get rid of private business. And that's a major distinction. It's not the same as Nordic Europe. It would make us like Cuba. It would make us like Venezuela. And so I think if we understood, our generation understood that one big lie, that big fact, this would really be a game changer in the fight against socialism. Yeah, it's such an important point. By the way, Morgan, you were cutting in and out some somewhat there, so I'm going to have a Nathan Matouche, producer extraordinaire, go ahead and get you back after he gets me and Christian on a on a two on a two screen. But your point is so well taken. I mean, in terms of the Nordic countries, we so often Bernie Sanders, Christian, makes that exact observation too that hey, you look at these Nordic or Scandinavian countries and they are all socialist societies, he points out, but to Morgan Zeger's point, that is not the case. If you look at the actual socialist societies, we're looking at a country like Cuba, for example, like the Soviet Union, like North Korea. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I think is a huge disconnect with our with our uh, culture and our society today, particularly young people, is that they're growing up in a generation that's reaping the benefits of all of the work that previous generations have done to fight communists and fight socialist regimes. And they're benefiting from the fruits of their parents' labors, which came about as a result of the free market uh, economy and capitalistic principles that we have here in the United States. And so they see all of this wealth and abundance and think that it was either illegitimately attained or they say, well, this this is possible. We want this for everybody else. But then they are sold this idea that the only way to do that is to force a redistribution to other people when in reality, it's the ability to have private industry and the ability for the individual to achieve their own success by providing a product that somebody else wants to purchase and that free market exchange that allows for this prosperity. When you force this redistribution and you limit people to how much they can or can't achieve, uh, what you create is equality for sure, but you create an equal 
equal poverty, where there isn't the ability for those uh, for Americans to succeed in abundance so that in turn they can be extremely generous with what they have. I think we see uh, people will often say that, oh, uh, capitalists are all greedy and it just leaves poor people impoverished and unable to get out of their out of their state. And I always tell them, I say, there's nothing more sympathetic than allowing every American to achieve what they can to the best of their abilities. Thing that is uh, celebrated and valued and so that they can take the abundance of their wealth and go and help uh, those who are less fortunate. I think we see an example of that in fruition right now with the, the family uh, of George Floyd. We see that Americans, despite coming out of this socialistic lockdown from coronavirus, are still putting up money to help these families in need and would be willing to do so for countless others uh, who have who are in need and who are impoverished. The homeless man uh, who had his things burned in these riots. Uh, Americans rallied around him, got him a, a new tent and mattresses and food. And we can do that, uh, but only because we have of ourselves to give in the first place. If you force down this socialistic, uh, uh, these socialistic policies and communist-like uh, policies for a government, what you end up doing is you disincentivize anybody from wanting to work and attaining a uh, profit level, and you make it impossible for there to be any wealth that we can help those who are less fortunate with. Our system of free market capitalism allows anybody who wants to the opportunity to succeed. The socialistic and communist model prevents them from doing so. And like I said, results in equality, un undoubtedly, but equal misery and equal poverty, which is why everybody who comes from one of these socialist countries like Venezuela or Cuba is dying to get out because they cannot succeed and they cannot move up from their state in life no matter how hard they try. Very well put. Uh, Morgan Ziegers, let me ask you uh, from, of course, Young Americans Against Socialism. When we look at this argument about economic inequality, which is one of the justifications that American socialists like to put forward, especially to young people, to say, hey, we've got this economic inequality. We need government to step in and help people. What is your counter argument to that? Yes, and I think Christian touched on a good point where uh, pretty much the left has to monopolize the morality spectrum. And so they really do act like they are the moral side. And you mentioned earlier, Jimmy, uh, the road to serfdom. In the road to serfdom, Hyatt talks about how the left will distort basic language in order to uh, distort the narrative in general in their favor. And so that's why they use words like justice, freedom, morality, equality, fairness. What is fair? in the term of the left. I, I don't know. And so what I would suggest for conservatives and for people who love freedom and, and or even just are on the base of classical liberalism and are hoping to come together as Republicans and Democrats, I say we start focusing on results-oriented messaging that is similar to the left. And so the left says Medicare for all. I say conservatives talk about how they want to increase access to affordable health care for all Americans. All Americans deserve access to affordable health care. How do we achieve that? It's a little different than the left. We have different ideas. We believe in competition and, and uh, transparency and pricing. We have solutions for these problems, but unfortunately, again, the left is monopolizing morality, and we need to take it back. I think it will come with messaging and with focusing on the issues that young Americans care about most, like I said, health care, but also climate change, environmental issues, and the student loan crisis. These are three ways we can really win back young Americans. Morgan Ziegers, I think you hit on a few very important points, including one I was wanting to get to. So first of all, what is fair? I don't know what it is you said. That's because nobody knows what it is. It's entirely a subjective term, what is fair. Also, to your point about providing alternatives, I'm all about proposition, not just opposition. We need to boldly say no to socialism, no to big government, no to government-orchestrated solutions, as they like to call them and yes to alternative ideas. But then also to your point about results, I have a clip of our patron economist, Milton Friedman, from, I don't know if this is the 1970s or the 1980s, but in Cut 6, he talks exactly about the importance of addressing results. Let's take a listen to this. The crucial thing is to look beneath the surface. Don't look at what the proponents of one system or another say are their intentions, but look at what the actual results are. Socialism, which means government ownership and operation of means of production, has appealed to high-minded, fine people, to people of idealistic views, because of the supposed objectives of socialism, especially because of the supposed objectives of equality, 
and social justice. Now those are fine objectives. And it's a tribute to the people of good will that those objectives should appeal to them. But you have to ask the question, does the system, no matter what its proponents say, produce those results? And once you look at the results, it's crystal clear that they do not. Where are social injustices greatest? Social injustices are clearly greatest where you have central control. The degree of social injustice and torture in a place like in, and incarceration in a place like Russia is of a different order of magnitude than it is in those Western countries where most of us have grown up and in which we have been accustomed to regarding freedom as our natural heritage. Judge results, not intentions. Indeed, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Morgan Ziegers, watching that clip from before any of the three of us was born is pretty striking. I think he put it into perspective pretty well what you were getting at in terms of results. Absolutely. I actually have not seen that clip before, so that makes me feel pretty excited because I had just come up with the idea of focusing on results-oriented messaging while I was in my car. Uh, while I was in my shower, just concepting and coming you. up with ideas where we could try and win over young Americans. So, so I feel pretty good about that. But I think an important point to talk about with COVID-19, with uh, what happened with George Floyd, with what's happening with uh, communist China, there's a lot of instances right now where we're seeing the overbearing power of government and the impact that a big government can have on your life. And so a lot of people say young Americans support socialism so much because we've never had to live through those times. We weren't around when Milton Friedman was, Friedman was around. Uh, we weren't around during the USSR. We didn't personally experience Fidel Castro's tyrannical rule. And so we don't understand the terrors of it. But now we are seeing the implications of a communist China and the fact that they hid and censored information about COVID-19 existing and then spreading from person to person. It caused a lot of damage. On top of that, we're seeing what happens when, when you want justice for something like what happened with George Floyd. Do you want to be able to seek justice or do you want an overbearing government that will prevent you from seeking that justice? That lack of justice, that injustice comes from socialist and communist governments where the people have no power to fight back and seek uh, justice and reprimanding under the law. Christian Lasfall, your thoughts on this results question and some of what Morgan said. No, absolutely. I agree with everything that she said. I think a lot of times the socialist idea is sold as though if you, if we in, uh, enact socialism, it will be a utopia. Everybody will, will be well taken care of. Everybody will have good health care, good education. But when you look at countries who have tried to implement these very things across all of world history, we can rewind through all of civilization. Any time that there had been a, a socialist type government implemented, we saw that it, it resulted in negative results, that it resulted in greater poverty, that it resulted in greater sickness, ailment, um, people being tortured for disagreeing with their government. So a lot of times it's sold as though if we enact these policies that it will suddenly be a utopia. And what we have to recognize and what young people have to recognize is that in this fallen world, there is no such thing as a utopia. There will always be sin and people will always make mistakes. People will always do bad things. Not everybody will always attain the same levels of success that somebody else will, we have to recognize that we will never be in a perfect world where everybody has everything to the best of their abilities until God returns and we're all living in Christ's second coming. That's not going to happen. Um, and so what we have to do is then talk about what is the system that provides the most opportunity and freedom for people to succeed. Uh, that's the question that we have to that we have to be asking ourselves and judge that based on the results. What results do we see coming from socialist communist countries? Nothing good. We don't see anything worth replicating in America, which is why our founders crafted our nation the way they did, with each individual having the opportunity to do what they can with the talents that they were born with and the abilities that they were given by God, their creator, to create product and exchange it in a free market system where if you, if you want what I have, we'll exchange, we'll trade, and through that free exchange, develop wealth and continue advancing in our society. Understanding that there will never be a perfect situation where everybody has everything in perfect condition, but creating the system that allows the best opportunity for the most people to live as best as they can. And then, like I said, as a cultural issue, emphasizing the importance of if you have been blessed with abundance of wealth and resources, to be generous with that, to help others to rise in their stature, not because the government forces you to, but because 
you willingly want to out of what you've been given. That is a good thing. But when the government forces it, when the government mandates it, like uh, that clip showed, the results are never, ever, ever what the socialist uh, yeah. utopians try and sell you. And how is government even able to make those determinations about what's going to be exactly. best? I mean, James Madison talked about how men are not angels, and that's why we have separation of powers. That's why we have a limitation on the size and scope of government in the United States Constitution is a recognition that you don't have philosopher kings that can govern over society and just make life better. And I want to put up some footage here we have of Venezuela, the most recent case of failure of uh, communism and socialism on the world stage because, look, the, the economic devastation has just been, been terrible across that country of Venezuela because of this idea of nationalization. I mean, they're even right now, Venezuela, of all places, is having to get oil from Iran. That is, that is unheard of and stunning. And we need to keep in mind that that is a primary example today of real socialism. Now, I want to spend our remaining moments here with the two of you talking about what we need to do in order to express the vice that is socialism better to young people. What is the message that we need to get across and how do we do it? And I'll start with you, Morgan Seekers, of Young Americans Against Socialism. Thank you. And, and I wish I could give you a simple answer. I'll try and keep it short, but there are, there's just so many factors that are playing into the issue here. Take there's a time, lack of please. values. There's a lack of education. Thank you. There's a lack of values. There's a lack of education. And on top of that, there's a major misunderstanding on uh, basic definitions. And so when it comes to education, I think in the classroom, what's being left out right now is uh, the initial promises of socialist leaders. So we learn a lot about the impact and the results of uh, people like Stalin, Lenin, Castro, and a lot of the other terrible dictators throughout history, Pol Pot. What you don't hear is that they came to power as a very positive uh, messaging leader and how they promised to change. They promised to champion the working people. They promised to provide a lot of really great free things, a utopian society. And uh, the only thing we learn about is the impact. We, so when what happens now is you hear those same promises being made by the American left and young Americans don't have the intellectual ammunition to say, oh, red flag should go off in my head. I've heard of these promises before and they have never come to fruition. When it comes to lack of values, I can't tell you how many times I get off stage and these older Americans come up to me and they say, please talk to my child. I sent them to college for a semester, and now they are coming to me for Thanksgiving saying that they're socialists, that they're voting for Bernie, and they want to see AOC become president. What do I do? And I see that as the more we bolster really great values in the minds of our children and the more we work on our families at the dinner table and the more we pass down the greatness of America, and the opportunity that comes in the American economy, the better off we're going to be when we do send our children into the education system, the more bolstered they will be in their own values. We can't rely on the government to pass down values rooted in uh, common sense economics and, and uh, just being a good person. And you mentioned earlier, James Madison said, we're not perfect human beings. We absolutely aren't. And I will bring attention to the fact that the left is using pop cult. They're using uh, Teen Vogue. Teen Vogue sponsored a table and a panel at the Socialist Party of America's convention in 2019. At this panel, guess what they talked about? They talked about deconstructing the American family and in order to promote socialism. What happens, and I've talked about this actually with the Falkirk Center, what happens is when you don't have those other sources of happiness in your life, you are more likely to focus on the financial situation you are in and be jealous and be unhappy with the situation that you are in economically. So I think that the more we can provide alternative sources to happiness, like religion, like family, like relationships, like love, and like children, uh, we're going to be able to focus more on uh, moving us forward as a community instead of focusing on central planning to fix people's problems in their lives. So uh, I'll leave it to that. And Christian, you can probably fill up for me. Please, Christian, go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, I think one of the most important things to try and, and, and change the minds of our young people away from this idea that socialism is, is of any benefit to a culture and a society, it starts in the home. It starts in the home with families. It starts in churches. Those are the two first forms of government, the family and the church, before we get to elected officials in local, state, and federal governments. Politics is down, uh, downstream from our culture. So I think it starts there. And one of the biggest inhibitors to this happening right now is, and you can see it from the left in their staunch opposition to school choice. Why? Because that would afford people the opportunity to talk about different ideas that are 
uh, different than what today's socialist left is trying to sell us. And if we are able to tell people about those ideas, they're going to be more inclined to disagree with the socialist mantra and go toward a more free market capitalistic society. That's why they're so opposed to it. So I think that uh, our churches and our families, uh, things work like what the Falkirk Center is doing, where we're not a political organization, we're, we're engaging our culture and trying to reach young people with these ideas um, to te teach families and teach pastors. We're building a pastor's network to talk with them about how they can talk about these issues with their congregations and with their kids. That's where it starts. That's why you see the left trying to get kids in public school from as close to birth as they possibly can, because they can start indoctrinating them with a system of ideas and then prohibiting them from doing any kind of private schools or charter schools that might differ from what the leftist government approved narrative is that they want you to get. Yeah, I think something else to keep in mind is, is a quote, we said it last week, it just came to mind, so I'm going to read it from Nikita Khrushchev, who was from the 50s and 60s, he was in uh, the Soviet Union, he was their general secretary. We can't expect the American people to jump from capitalism to communism, but we can assist their elected leaders in giving them small doses of socialism until they awaken one day to find that they have communism. We do not have to invade the United States. We will destroy you from within. Morgan Ziegers, I think those are some words we need to be thinking about as we move forward with combating this socialist idea spreading across America. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I wake up every morning and I think of people like that who have said those things, and it makes me even more inspired to keep fighting for this country. I do want to uh, mention, though, in The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, it talks about uh, techniques that you can use to internally corrupt someone and to really break them down in order to control them. And one of the really great points was that a happy man, a satisfied man, is a free man. You can't, if somebody's busy going to their job and feeling satisfied in the work they do and they go get to take care of their family and they're building their home and they're building up their own lifestyle, they are not interested in the BS that you are peddling. And so that's, I think, thing uh, Christian hit the nail on the head with that. If we provide people resources, if we provide people information and bolster them in the values that keep them happy and satisfied and appreciative of what we do have in America, we'll be less likely to be ungrateful for what we have in this country. No system is perfect. Capitalism isn't perfect, but it does provide us the opportunity to build a really wonderful lives for, for life for ourselves. And the better we improve as individuals, the better our communities are going to be, and it's going to grow up into our federal government. So I'm very excited for the future. I don't think 70 percent of young Americans want to seize the means of production, even though they may say they would vote for a socialist. Instead, I think they're very capitalist. They are, they are very entrepreneurial, innovative, creative, and they have the values of the American spirit deep down. We just have to stop the left from distorting uh, what capitalism and Americanism really are. And I think, Christian, real quickly, um, one of the things that I look at in terms of millennials and Generation Z and winning them over is this misunderstanding about capitalism and a belief that capitalism is responsible for the economic malaises we have seen over the past decade or so from the 2009 recession that resulted from the 0708 financial crisis on to today with what we're seeing with the coronavirus pandemic and what have you. And that's part of it. They're looking for an alternative to capitalism and they see, oh, it must be socialism. That must be the alternative. It's the other idea, the other possibility for us that will help people and address inequality. And I think it then comes down to first principles and making sure that young people can understand those. Well, and I would also say that the, the economic harm that we faced because of the coronavirus lockdowns was precisely because we stopped capitalism. We didn't allow the market to yeah. carry on. We didn't allow uh, Americans to, to adapt to the circumstances around them and modify their business structure so that they could continue providing their product and keep the market operating with increased safety standards. That's not an unreasonable uh, thing for the government to allow us to do. We see them doing it now, allowing people to go protest in masses, yelling, singing, all the things they told churches and private businesses. You can't do that. You have to stay shut down. All of a sudden, when they found something that uh, presents better political capital for them, they're totally okay with it now. But they couldn't trust the American citizen to use their individual liberty and accommodate their businesses to continue to operate with heightened safety standards. Um, and so when, when people say, well, look, capitalism failed during coronavirus. No, 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 no. You stopped capitalism and started a more socialist type system and that's why it failed. 
It's precisely because you didn't allow capitalism to keep operating that we faced the economic hardship that we did. And so that's why a lot of conservatives have rightly commented that the coronavirus lockdowns were merely a trial run of socialism and a good demonstration. Thank God we still have the capitalist system that we can revert back to. We just saw the jobs report come out today that had a bunch, I think it was 2.5 million jobs added way above the projected uh, measures that the capitalist economy can begin to recover. But we did see a mini trial run of what socialism would look like, uh, where you were short on things like toilet paper. If people don't think that's a reality, even for uh, Americans who go visit Cuba, they ration your toilet paper at restaurants, two squares to the bathroom for each time that you go. So these are realities that exist in these socialist uh, countries. And we didn't experience them in America because capitalism failed. We experienced them in America because we stopped capitalism and decided to trial run socialism for the well, time being. Let me say this. I think that you two, like so many others, Morgan Ziegers and Christian Lasfall, really helped to give hope for those who are looking for hope in America today as we continue in this trajectory towards bigger and bigger government and perhaps on the road to socialism. Thank you both for joining us today. Really appreciate the conversation. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, Morgan Ziegers, founder of Young Americans Against Socialism, and Christian Lasfall, who's an ambassador at the Falkirk Center at Liberty University, both joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. And really, truly, there is cause for hope. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. There is cause for hope, and it is individuals like Morgan and Christian, I hope myself as well, Nathan Matouche, working the Matouche Magic as producer extraordinaire and many others who provide that hope that we can and will move past this misunderstanding, this false belief of socialism. You just watched a clip from Jimmy at the Crossroads. Don't miss more engaging, intelligent talk. Subscribe to the Jimmy at the Crossroads YouTube channel today. You want to catch our live show. And I love your support. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads. Making sense out of no one, no sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>